All right, I think that is everyone we have currently. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships here at the Wharton Estrick Museum. And I'm so excited for you to join us today for a spotlight talk with Jeffrey Berwind exploring Wharton Estrick's music stand. This is a short 20 minute talk with about five minutes for questions at the end. Um, before we get started with today's program, though, I would love to remind you that on March 19th, we'll celebrate the young artist who won prizes in imprint, our annual high school printmaking competition. Uh, during the program, we'll also explore a selection of Estrick woodcuts that highlight his approach to storytelling, as well as several works by the prize winners I'm showing there on the right. Um, the first place winner, uh, Winnie Kenny's Portrait of the Hutch. Um, now in its 15th year, the imprint program encourages new generations of young artists to share their voices and vision in this dynamic medium. We're so thrilled today though, to have Jeffrey Berwind with us to help dig deeper into an exhibition at WEM that was made possible by his generosity. One Object, Many Stories, looks at the music stand that Wharton Estrick developed for Jeffrey's grandmother, Rose, who, along with her husband, Nat, were not only significant patrons and friends of Wharton's, but also instrumental to the founding of the museum. And I love this photo on the left of the Rubensons with Estrick uh, in, in the mid 60s, kind of having, having a great time together. And then of course on the right there, the living room of their remarkable home. The show is open through May 14th, 2023, so you have plenty of time to see it this spring. Uh, Jeffrey has kindly brought the music stand that uh, Eshrick made for Rose to Wem for the show, as well as some other treasures from his personal collection, including this drawing. Um, this will never happen if the lower shelf is properly used, and you see there um, uh, Rose falling asleep at the music stand. Um, Jeffrey is a member of WEM's board of directors, as well as a professional storyteller and coach. He supported thousands of individual clients and organizations, including Historic Philadelphia, the National Park Service, the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, in using the power of story to make an impact. So you can see why there are so many reasons that we are thrilled to have Jeffrey with us today to tell us some of his stories. Um, I'll ask ask folks if they haven't done so already to mute themselves. Uh, if you have questions for Jeffrey, we'll have time at the end, but feel free to put questions in the comments throughout. Um, you can note that you'd either like to save those for Jeffrey at the end, or if one of my colleagues from WEM, um, Larissa is here uh, helping to support this program, can answer them, we'll do so. Um, at the end, when we come to the question and answers, portion of the, of the conversation, feel free to unmute yourselves and just ask questions. We'll have a nice conversation. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see Jeffrey and we'll begin. So I'm Jeffrey. already I'm already annoyed. I'm already annoyed because looking at that gorgeous music stand and then looking at this door behind me, square, <laughs> you know, not real wood. And then look at these bookcases. IKEA and Eshrick never knew each other. And I'm like, it's, I'm, already, I'm already annoyed. So I don't know what to say. We're, we're we'll go from the sublime to the ridiculous back to the sublime again today. If that if that works plan. for you, that's like a it's like a sublime sandwich. <laughs> Well, Jeffrey, I've given you a little introduction here. Um, I'm curious if you would like to just introduce yourself to, to the folks on the call today. Yeah, and, I, and a lot of friends here. I'm glad to see you. And, uh, you know, my grandparents really brought me up. Um, they, they, uh, they were very involved with my upbringing. And so I grew up in a house full of Eshrick, thought nothing of it till I was an adult, and no doubt probably spilled chocolate milk all over the dining room table, and they never gasped, so I guess it was okay. And they really instilled in me, uh, I, I ended up running the family businesses, we had some depart uh, small department store in New Holland, PA, and I was really just spent most of my life until my grandparents passed away about 20 years ago, really they were my best friends and they gave me a love of business and the arts. And I never got to attend because I was too young, but I know they had New Year's Eve parties and there were famous, there was Orlando Cole, a famous cellist, and there were artists and there was Wharton. And could you imagine it was probably a modern day Lower Marion Salon that <laughs> I wish I had been old enough and not just jerky teenager going, oh, what are these old people doing <laughs> you know, that I wish I had been there? 
Um, <clears throat> and eventually uh, they left the collection to me. And over the years, we've sold it off lot most of the collection so that it's all safe and i'm just so happy to see the music stand where it was created at the mm. uh, museum so how, how would you describe your relationship with the music stand i know that you've had the chance to engage with so many of of wharton's works in your grandparents home but i know the music stand is a special one for you what's what's your connection with with that piece like well, I would invite any of you watching this. Is there something in your home or your office that you would grab in the fi in a fire, God forbid, a fire, or just it touches your heart more than your head? And that's the music stand. Um, that music stand is the, it is today's um, sort of manifestation of my grandparents. Whenever I look at it, I think nanny, I think granddad. And so I see the beauty of it, but it represents the people who brought me up who really gave me the love of so much opera mm. and the arts and every time i go to the museum i feel like there are my grandparents you know <laughs> and so i see that picture of sitting them sitting on the porch i'm like yeah that, that makes a lot of sense so it's uh, really a heart thing and the news which i haven't even told you julie and i may not do this because i hate to practice but driving to work today and knowing we were going to do this you know i realized you know i need to learn the cello and I need to, I need to, you know, my best friend plays the piano and I need to do cello piano duets because growing up, my grandmother and I would, after we would have, you know, sandwiches on the Eshrick table, we would go upstairs to her music room and I played the viola poorly. She played the cello adequately and we would go up to her little study in Marion and books everywhere and all her tchotchkelas everywhere. And she would put on LPs, remember LPs? and the greatest musicians playing chamber music. And I would take the viola and she would uh, she would do the cello and we would play along with Rusta Provrich and Isaac Stern. And they were fabulous. We were ghastly. We just turned up the volume. And at the end of any quartet, we would just burst out laughing. And that was the memories, you know, how music just pervaded their house. So the music stand, to be honest, I never saw her actually play on it because I think they realized right away it was a unique piece of sculpture. Um, but when I did see her sit on it for a, a posed piece for the Philadelphia Inquirer, she forgot to put her, her shoes on. And you could see a picture of her in the Inquirer, posed in front of the music stand in white socks. I'm like, okay, that's Nanny. <laughs> that, that idea of this object as, as a sort of personification of these people who, who meant so much to you. Um, the music stand must hold all of these incredible stories for you. Are there stories beyond you know the this the one that you've just shared with us that that really feel like they're embodied in this piece of piece of art well it's all intertwined you know miriam was my grandmother's cousin so you know we have the stories that miriam told and nanny told and granddad told and we hear from wharton and uh you know, when we did the docents event a little while ago, I did share the story of that that dining room table where the which was right near the music stand with and that dining room table has three stories attached to it, at least. Number one, when they commissioned it, Nanny grew up in a big family. She said, Wharton, I got to have 10 to 12 people sitting at this table. He went, never have more than eight people to dinner. And I refuse to make it any bigger than that. So he had they did that. Then he delivers the table. I know I'm not talking about the music stand, but I have stories about the table. <laughs> and uh, he he's over for lunch one day and he's looking at the legs of the table. He's like, mm, not working for me. So my grandparents understood him. He said, okay, whatever you want, Wharton. And he sends his, his helpers. They pick up the table, take it back to the studio, put new legs on it, re-delivers it. And like a month later, sends a bill for the new legs. It was his idea. They liked it. And my grandfather would tell that story and he would pause and say, and we paid it. And then the <laughs> third story, which I think tells a lot about Wharton, and this is my favorite, with the same table. They're having one of their big parties and uh, somebody accidentally stubbed out her cigarette on the table, on the table, and Wharton's at the party. And you could almost hear the, <gasps> you know, uh, but, you know, Wharton walks over, he looks at it, he goes, you know, I'll sand it over, it adds character. And I think that is one of my favorite things to think about Wharton. He was not into the hoity-toity, you know, famously, you wear sunglasses, he's not going to probably do any work for you. 
you're going to knock on his door unannounced. He's probably going to say, get the heck out of here. You know, he did his thing. And um, I could see why my grandparents and he were very close. They shared laughter a mm. lot. And those of you that know, knew Wharton or know of Wharton, you know that his stories and his laughter and his unconventionality, and my grandparents were unconventional. So uh, sort of an indirect answer about the music stand, because I don't have a lot of stories about the music stand, except that yeah. it was just plain gorgeous. But I think you've touched on something here, which is that um, these objects, the, the things that Wharton made and that people lived with, they have lives outside of you know, their making. They have these, these lives that are longer than the sort of commissioning of the, of the piece itself. And you've lived with the music stand, right? This has been the piece that from our previous conversations, I understand is one of the, the pieces that you've, you've had with you the longest. And I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about that life, the life of the music stand in your home and what living with it has, has taught you. Yeah, and actually, my grandparents had it until my grandmother Rose passed away in 2002, and at that point, it went over to my place. And um, and again, think about you know, for me, the music stand is my grandmother, really my grandparents, both of them. Um, so when it's in my apartment or when I had a home or whatever, you know, they're part of them are there, and it's right near a portrait that Sankowski did of my grandmother in her 40s. So I'm seeing not only a an iconic piece of art, but I'm like, there's Nanny. So to live with it, when I first moved it over after she had passed away, it was highly emotional, as you could well imagine. When, um, you know, when I would send it out on uh, a tour a little bit, the Wayne Art Center and other places, when I really brought it to its new permanent home, really at the, the museum, it was very emotional. I'm like, I'm packing it in the back seat of my Nissan Sentra and I'm driving it over. And I, Julie was there and she took pictures of me pulling it out of the back seat. I'm like, good thing I didn't run into an accident or something. But, <laughs> you know, to, to, to return it to where it was made, knowing that my grandparents were on site and knowing that really in a special way, Wharton's friend patrons, because his patrons became close friends, that's just very special. It, the artist is not some abstract. He 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 cherished friendship. He cherished individuality, and he was revolutionary and he unconventional. So when I see the music stand, live with the music stand, I'm seeing all these things that I aspire to. Mm -hmm. Even at age 67, I still want to, in a sense, you know, be revolution, not revolting. I want to be revolutionary, and <laughs> go against, uh, you know, go against the grain, literally, perhaps. I love that, that sort of um, uh, call to live in an unconventional way coming from this object, not only because of Wharton's identity, but also, you know, the way that your grandparents lived. I know that in previous conversations, we've also talked about um, the music stand embodying a certain kind of grace. Uh, and I'm curious if you can say a little bit more about that. Totally agree. You know, there's so many ways, a number of docents are here. There's so many ways to give a tour of the studio, right? You can give it, you can give a nautical tour. You can give a dance tour. Um, I think of it, as many of us do, is what would a sculptor do with furniture, interiors, homes? When you look at it through the the, the, the form, right? The eurythmic dances, the Holly and I were talking about, look at that chimney in the con building. That is just so not con, right? It's movement, it's sculptural. And um, yeah, so when you see something like the music stand, which is grace itself, especially when you look at the profile of it, it's, it's, it's sort of a wow. Mm. I know you've talked a little bit about what it feels like to see the music stand back at the museum. Um, I'm curious if it's been interesting to see it in context with some of these other pieces of paper, drawings, sort of these, these the ephemera documenting this relationship, um, to have that as a part of the story as well. Well, as Julie remembers, and Holly, I think we did that the, when I brought it back to the museum for the first time, we put it in the dining room. So to see it in that context was like, what? And then we brought one of the copies 
and put it right next to it back to back just to see the difference. And it was so many clear differences. So mm. it was like, okay, this is the prototype. The copies are wonderful, but they're clearly not the same. And then we moved the copy out of the way and just have it sitting there knowing that Wharton sat a few feet away at that dining room table all the time. It kept selling the dining room table to other people. You know, it was really, it's really cool. It's where it belongs. You know, it's like a, um, I don't know, it's a reunion in wood, right? <laughs> Maybe that'd be the name for a book. <laughs> we've, we've, we've got a homecoming, right? I, exactly. I, I think, uh... Exactly. It's it's gone from um, uh, one temporary home to another temporary home to you know its its point of creation. Jeffrey, are there stories or things that you wish people knew about the music stand or your grandparents that they might not know already? That's a really interesting question. I don't not necessarily. But I would say that Rose and Nat totally, they were very close with Wharton, so there must have been a kinship. Um, and I think, given that it's been called the iconic piece of the whole movement by the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, why is that? It, and then maybe it's the perfect marriage of form and function, right? Which was Wharton's ethos. And, uh, so whether the stories, but I guess it's more, it just sort of is the visual representation of a philosophy, perhaps. I'm thinking out loud with you. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm aware between you and I and everybody listening in, I never saw Nanny actually use the music stand. So I wonder if it had a special, if they, I don't know, but I just wonder if they realize, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to use something else. I'm too nervous around it. Mm. Um, now, the, I will say this, the cartoon you showed earlier, the drawing by Wharton of the, the bottle of booze on the lower shelf, my grandmother didn't drink. Just putting it out there, you know, <laughs> she did. That's Wharton <laughs> doing the Wharton thing. The uh, Now, you do know, connected to it, should I tell briefly the, you've heard it before, the, but the piano bench story? Absolutely. I think, I think Jeffrey, if you would tell that story, and while you're telling that story, um, if people have questions for Jeffrey, get those ready, because I think we'll, we'll move into questions. But yes, please, please share that with us. This is as close as it gets to the music uh, response. So uh, later in his life, they had a conversation about Wharton, maybe would you consider building a piano for us? And of course, that makes our brains explode. What would a Wharton Eshrick piano look like? And he thought about it, he saw the complexity, he decided not to. I think it was, it was later in his life. So my grandparents said, well, how about a music bench? And he's over at their house in Lower Marion. And my grandmother at the time had a, you know, a factory built upright piano and the typical bench with a lid. And they're sitting there. And my grandmother said, now, Wharton, here's the thing. If you're going to make a piano bench for me, I must have a lid and the shelf, you know, because I got to, you know. And Wharton know, knew her very well and said, Rose, what do you need the lid and the, and the shelf for? Well, for my music, my sheet music. And he said, okay. He stands up, he walks over to the bench, he opens the bench. There's cough drops, sucking candy, note card stationery, stamps, pens, pencils, not one sheet of music. And he roared with laughter and he said, I'll do it without the lid. And, uh, <laughs> and so that's, I love that story because that's that's the relationship. Um, just, just ridiculously funny. <laughs> Jeffrey, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your memories and um, and really with with this object. We're so thrilled to have it on view for folks. Um, if you come to the museum through uh, mid-May, you'll have a chance to see it as well, along with the image. Um, Carol, I noted we'll put that in the follow-up email and some other wonderful pieces of um, ephemera related to the music stand from Jeffrey and also from the museum's archival collections. I'd love to open it up to questions. Is there anyone who, who'd like to ask, um, ask a question while we have Jeffrey here today? I think I've stunned people into silence. It's really, that's, <laughs> that's an, another achievement for my, for 2023. Jeffrey, I'd like to know when you're going to start your cello lessons. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> you know, it's not going to end well. It's not going to. Of first course of it all, is. It's going to be wonderful. Well, here's the thing. I tried it like 20 years ago and like, ow, 
you know, if you're yes. starting to get used to those strings yes. are thick. My grandmother had this great story that, you know, when she was taking music lessons, the cellist, you've got to do this, you know, this thing where you're, you're that's the vibrato thing of for the cello well so she would walk around the streets of philadelphia like this until she realized people thought she might have palsy so she stopped doing that <laughs> like natty i was chatting with bonnie who's on who's on the program and she was saying uh she's a very amateur guitar player uh and when i tried to learn guitar same thing it hurt my fingers it hurts. and i i can't imagine a cello string is yeah. bigger and fatter and harder to yeah. so yeah there, there's but, like all art there's pain and suffering involved Oh, that's a good reframe. Maybe that's what I'll, I'll just, when I'm going out, 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 I'll just say, well, this is the artist. I'm making art. I'm making art. Although my neighbors would probably disagree vehemently. They probably would. Yeah. We stop. What cat are you throwing out the window? Stop it. <laughs> Cute. Any other questions or thoughts for Jeffrey? Oh, I see. I see Jasper. Oh, I think, and I think you're on mute, Jasper. Okay. You can hey, hear Jasper. Me now. Yes. Hello. Good to see you. Yeah, I'm. I'm sort of interested in how Orton Morton dealt with his, um, you know, with his clients. Whether he came over to the house and and looked around and thought, well, maybe. Uh, Maybe the music stand needs to have a few measurements to fit the person, you know, um, kind of interviewing, interviewing the subject so that he could get, he could get the form and the, and the basic functional design correct, if you know what I mean. And I'm wondering if he ever did that with your, any of the things that he did for your family. Yeah, and I would love any of the, the staff to chime in on these kind of questions too. That would be, it's a great question, Jasper, and I can only assume it happened. I know they lived in a in a, a duplex in Lower Marion near St. Joe's, so it was a small house. And I know that me, uh, at least, a gosh, a third of the collection was probably built in. So I know of me measurements for shelves. Uh, they changed they covered a whole stair banister with both a ca cabinet and shelves and so uh for the music stand i i guess i i wonder if he sat her down and said hold the cello and let me take a look but i would only be surmising yeah mm. it, it'll be interesting jasper if you haven't had a chance to see it yet one of the pieces from the museum's archival collections that we have um on display in a case is um, a drawing with those original measurements for the music stand um, on a sort of scrap of paper. So you can imagine, you know, maybe uh, Asher toying around with those after a, a, a conversation with Rose. Um, you know, I'm I'm projecting here, but it's a lovely bit of of uh, documentation. Yeah. Of course, it begs the question: Don't we say on the tours that his favorite tool is an axe? <laughs> like, I don't think so for the music stand. <laughs> well, I think that is the time that we have for today. I want to thank Jeffrey again for um, his generosity with his information and with his time today. I'll encourage everyone to come back for the next Spotlight Talk, uh, which is, I believe, April 18th. That will focus on... Um, Eshrick's time at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts and his exhibition there will include some really wonderful new um, uh, video footage. So that should be very exciting. And hopefully we'll all see you on the 19th in just a few days for um, our imprint program. Um, if folks want to... I see a question off. came in from, from oh. Nina that I was just gonna address. Her question sure, was, please. Is, is there any copyright on making models of the music stand? Um, there is not copyright on on Eshrick furniture, Nina. So if you would like to make a music stand, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> make a cello first. Yes. Yeah. And then show us show us what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Any any cellos or uh, music stands that you make, you can send them to the museum. And <laughs> that's, the, that's the next competition. <laughs> you can you can reply to this uh, to the to the follow up email with with your music stands. Um, Wonderful. Can, can I just like uh, to, yeah, yeah, please, Jeffrey. 
I just wanted to say before we wrap up, um, you know, given my relationship with important patrons, uh, the the team running this museum is absolutely beyond five star and doing a magnificent job, not only preserving this place, but look preparing it for the future. Really, you know, just couldn't be more delighted. Uh, Nanny and Granddad and the other patrons are smiling down from heaven. I know they are. And I just wanted to shout out to the team that you're doing a great job. I'm going to bounce it right back at you, Jeffrey. Jeffrey is on the board of directors of the museum and is therefore part of that, part of that group that is stewarding and furthering this legacy. So thank you for, for noting that, but, but you are decidedly part of it. Thank you. As are all of you who attend and, and consume these programs. So thank you. Without further ado, if folks want to unmute we'll the themselves in what, is, in what is now a Wharton Eshrick Museum <laughs> Zoom tradition, and um, uh, just say goodbye before before heading off and going back into your day, um, we really enjoyed being with you, and I hope that we'll see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.